friends. Welcome back to the Wall Street Skinny. I'm Jen. I'm Kristen. And we are two lifelong friends with a combined 25 years of experience working and teaching on Wall Street here to give you the skinny on how high finance actually works and what all that stuff you hear on CNBC actually means for you. And speaking of CNBC, we are joined today by Guy Adami, whom you may recognize from his appearance as a fixture on CNBC's Fast Money or from his podcast on the tape uh, with his partner, Dan Nathan of Risk Reversal. And this is the perfect episode to pair with last week's episode, where we had Ashish Goyal on talking about global macro trading from the standpoint of a portfolio manager at the world's most elite hedge funds. Now we're going to be talking about global macro and market themes with someone whose Wall Street career has spanned close to 40 years, I think. Mm -hmm. So many people watch CNBC or read the financial news and honestly don't have the tools to understand a lot of the content. And Guy is so good at walking us through the basics of commodities trading, rates and equities trading, and also how to understand what's going on in the markets in the context of global central bank policy and more. So hopefully mm -hmm. after listening today, you will feel empowered. You will feel mm -hmm. educated. And mm -hmm. hopefully you're also going to be really entertained because I honestly think Guy is just flat out hilarious. And yeah. uh, in fact, one of the coolest parts, for me at least, was we get heckled all the time on social media by people who are like, you don't understand what finance is like in 2024. Like, go back to the 1980s. And we're like, uh, yeah, we were too. So mm -hmm. like, <laughs> we weren't exactly trading interest <laughs> rate drops, right? But Guy has the incredible perspective of someone who actually has seen the industry transform into the digitized, brave new world that it is today from like the trading floors of the 1980s that were mortalized mm -hmm. in like trading places. Oh, and speaking yes. of trading places. Yes. Jen has been telling me for the past, I, I mean, year that I need to watch it and I didn't. But I that night I went and I watched the, the movie, which was, it was interesting. Like it definitely was one of those things that we talked about this, like it could not have gotten made now. Correct. <laughs> but it was really cool to see what was happening on like the floor of the New York Mercantile Exchange. Like it was nuts. And I actually think that like, it kind of should be required watching for anyone who wants to go into any kind of markets role because yeah. it's actually just like, it's wild. Like, it's like, this is what it used to be like. And obviously it's mm -hmm. completely different now, but I still think it's just so interesting. So yeah. Well, when it you're was seeing numbers move around on a screen, you can envision yeah. them as the embodiment of little people running around yelling at each other. And that's how you can yeah. kind of think about market price action, right? That yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just like a herd. It. And then like one guy yeah. gets trampled. Like <laughs> it's, the whole thing was, I mean, again, it's, it's a, <laughs> it's an eighties movie. It's with Eddie Murphy and Dan Aykroyd and it's a great movie. Um, but yeah, there was definitely some stuff and you're like, oh, okay. Like yeah. the, the part at the end with the monkey, Al Franken was in. <sighs> he was one of the two people that was supposed to like watch the monkey. I don't, don't even like a, remember not, what monkey you're talking about. So this is at like, the end. There's like randomly this gorilla on a train, and yes, it's kind of like how yes, yes, they, yes, the like, guy in the gorilla costume, and then the gorilla in real life, the that's actual right. gorilla. I about yeah, yeah, that. yeah, yeah. But the it was but not Al one of Franken, the stronger points of the movie. No, it was, and then it was sort of very strange. But the point is that Al Franken was in it, and it was one of those other things that then I start going down a rabbit hole and like googling, like, was that actually Al Franken? <sighs> so anyway, it, thank you, guy, for making me finally watch it. Jen has been badgering me for literally a year. And okay, what's next happened. on our watch list? I've got billions looming, and the as industry, this yeah, giant thing I have to tackle. Yeah. Billions. Well, we need to do that together. No, no, no. First up is um, Succession season three. We're getting lots of people asking about that. So we got to yes. get season three and season four. And then Billions, someone literally asked us today about the industry. Like, is it mm -hmm. an accurate depiction of Wall Street? I have no idea. So we the have answer to watch is that. no, because I saw the previews for it and I was like, <laughs> this is bullshit. <laughs> but yeah. I'm excited yeah. to actually watch it. Yeah. And then I've started to rewatch Suits and we're going to touch on Suits with our lawyer podcast with the, oh, which yeah, is that'll be wildly. Good. Yeah. And you need to inaccurate. watch Wall Street, which you still haven't seen yet. Yes. Yes. And I think, is that is that one that's worth doing a review of or no? What do we think? No. No. Okay. <laughs> I don't actually, actually know what it's about. It's a terrible movie. It's, okay. Is that with Al Pacino? It, no. It's with oh. Michael Douglas and Charlie oh. Sheen. And okay. They, they all kind Carol of, to Hannah. me, are the same person, even though they're totally not. <laughs> well, they like merge together. You know what well, I mean? The, like they're all like in the Sheen's gangster movies. The yeah. Sheens and the Doug Lai, I think, are related. Am I confusing yeah. them? I think, they, right? Yeah, I think no, they it's, are. It's the yeah. Sheens and Emilio Estevez are related. Oh, yes. Yes. You're not, you're not wrong in that Douglas, Estevez, 
Bill Pullman, I kind of lump mm-hmm. in there in like yeah. those eighties, nineties actors. They're like all really good actors, distinguishable from it. Yes. Yeah. I don't know how great an actor Bill Pullman is. <laughs> oh, I actually, I couldn't pick him out of a lineup. I don't know that. He's, is, the, but... he's the president in Independence Day, which we saw together the weekend it premiered <laughs> in July of 1996. Oh my God, yeah. <laughs> and I feel like we got, what, like the Almond Joys and the, like, that was my favorite part about going to the movies with you is your mom let us get candy. My parents would never let me get candy. Your parents were really opposed to candy. Yeah. My parents were like, eat all the candy you want. Yeah. Was, That's it's... me now with my kids. I'm like, just eat whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think that there's actually something to that scientifically of because candy was never this mm-hmm. like forbidden thing for me. I, yeah. I don't I, I don't like obsess over it, right? I'm not like mm-hmm. lying awake at night being like, well, and I actually don't really like chocolate that much. So it makes it easy. Yeah. I love jelly beans. Like, Well, it's it's so funny you said that. I literally, before we hopped on, was listening to um, this podcast. <laughs> it was like matter of opinion. But they were talking about, I guess there's this new book by Jonathan Haidt out essentially saying how like smartphones and screens are the sort of problem with the world and and, like, you know, get rid of screens for kids, blah, 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 blah. But one of the um, arguments that somebody made was when she was a kid, her mother would never let her have TV and her friends who were, you know, TV was always on, like to her, the TV is white noise and it's not seen as this like really, Mm -hmm. you know, whatever forbidden thing. And for the woman who was not allowed to watch TV to her, she's like, I can't focus it. There's a TV on. I have to watch it. So it was sort of funny how it's like, yeah, that is so true because I had a TV in my bedroom from the time I I was like four years old. (laughs) Yeah. This was another thing. It was like, this is wild. Who are these like, like laissez faire parents who have their TV in their child's bedroom. And now it's a chore for me to sit down and watch TV. You're always like, oh, did you watch this? Did you watch this? Like, I mean, my husband and I always joke that our favorite show to watch on TV is nothing. We will turn on like the screensaver on the TV and be like, oh, because our brains Mm -hmm. are so fried by the end of the day. Watching TV actually, especially if it's like bad TV, it doesn't relax me. I don't need more stimulation. Although I really Mm. do like, again, if you're not watching it, Shogun is really, really worth it. It's worth a read and then a watch. And I don't think this is one of those things where you read the book and then you watch the show and you're like, how dare they change it? They definitely change it a ton, but because Mm -hmm. they take so much creative license with it, it's fine. Yeah. 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 I'll have to add that. You told, you told John to watch that on his way to Japan. He did not, but I will watch it. So now that we've <laughs> we're totally, that we're off totally off the rails, I That's have okay. no creative segue to bring back, <laughs> to bring That's this fine. back to Guy Adami. <laughs> so we're going to bring on Guy now. <laughs> we are joined here by Guy Adami, whom you may have seen daily on CNBC. I feel, I, I feel a little starstruck. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> like having uh, this is my Taylor Swift moment. Okay. You, okay. I'm not a huge Listen, Swiftie, but... <laughs> please stop. You're embarrassing yourself. I mean, Really? <laughs> That's like hey, you guys make a here. lot of music references in your content, which I very much appreciate, as well as good puns. Um, and for those of you who don't know, the Risk Reversal guys also have content called OK Computer, which for Radiohead fans and kids of the 90s and elder millennials is outstanding. But Guy, can you talk us a little bit through your background, your bio, how you got started in the industry and what you do now? How long is this podcast? I mean, <laughs> I'll do the whittled down version. Yeah, so give us I'm the, the elevator speech. Oldest of five kids, grew up in Croton on the Hudson, New York. My mm-hmm. parents were attorneys, and that's important for a number of different reasons. I tell this story, and I think this will resonate with your viewers and listeners. My parents met on the first day of law school in 1960. Five women walked into an auditorium filled with men for the first day of orientation, and the guy running the orientation looked around the room, identified those five women who were sitting in different places, and said to them, listen, I'm not sure why you're here. You're not going to get a law degree. You might meet your future husband, but that's about it. And in the case of my mother, he was half right because she met my father that first day. All those five women graduated, by the way, from law school. And I tell that story because you learn very quickly or early in life, never allow people to dictate or tell you what you can and can't do. And you know, that obviously resonated with me and my four other siblings. My mother was a bit of a badass. So oldest this. of five, went to Georgetown. I knew where Go Wall boys. Street was, but mm-hmm. I didn't know what it meant. And yeah. both my parents, who at that point were practicing together, were representing a gentleman that had left his job as a commodity trader and walked over to Drexel Burnham on 60 Broad Street. And in the course of their representation of him. It was my senior year in college. And they said, look, our son guy 
Is it school? Would it be okay if he came and talked to you? So for a week over Christmas break, I went down to 60 Broad Street every day, jackassed in from Croton on the Hudson, got into the, <laughs> you know, basically the desk about 7 a.m. Yeah. Sat there each day until Friday when finally somebody walked up to me and said, and I'll spare you the vernacular. Was it who the hell what are the, you? <laughs> yeah, what do you, you came here every day this week. Like, what's your deal, Junior? Like, what do you want to do? I said, I was hoping to get a job. And back in 1986, it was a lot easier to get jobs. It was easy to lose them as well. And they said, okay, when do you graduate? I said, in May. They said, come back when you graduate. And that's how I got my job at Drexel Burnham. And that's awesome. I got to tell you something. I've been navigating and weaving and bobbing ever since. And here we are, 2024, was that 38 years later? Mm -hmm. And there are no straight lines in life. And if you told me back then we'd be on a television show for the last 17 years, I'd say you're out of your effing mind. <laughs> now, for our listeners who are not familiar with Drexel Burnham, I think of Drexel Burnham, maybe this is a bad analogy, but I think of so many of the people who have come out of Lehman as like the current class of people who've come out of a formerly great and mm -hmm. reputable Wall Street institution that is now resigned to the ashes. I think mm -hmm. of Drexel Burnham having started so many careers of people who are at the absolute helm and upper echelons of Wall Street. Can you talk a little bit about what the role and perception of Drexel is now in the pages of history? I love that question. And I think you're spot on in terms of your assessment. For you football fans out there, Drexel Burnham, they were sort of the Oakland Raiders of Wall Street. Everybody, unless you were a fan or unless <laughs> Do you, you see Christian there, my eyes glazing over? We're like, oh, we're <laughs> Patriots fans. <laughs> well, but we you get my England. drift because yes, yes, yes. everybody hated them and they were scared of them. But quite frankly, in the recess of their mind, they sort of like, they're sort of cool. And that's what Drexel Burnham was. And Wall Street is littered with Drexel people to mm -hmm. this day. But I will tell you sort of anecdotally, I knew Drexel was screwed in 1990, I think. We had a huge Drexel event. It was either at the Metropolitan Museum of Art or the New York Public Library. I don't remember. I'll spare you the, <laughs> some of the details, but I was in the men's room and I looked to the urinal next to me and a guy was half my size. I'm like, that's a short little fella. And I walked out and my buddy in the dove said, you know, who you were taking a leak next to. I said, I have no idea. He's like, that's Fred Joseph. He runs the firm. And I said, holy shit, we're <laughs> totally screwed. And sure <laughs> enough, like six months later, Drexel went bankrupt. But wait, 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 why? Because he was short? Yeah. No, I have a thing about that. There, no, I, mean, well, I, I will say. Trust people. I trust people. You know, <laughs> six one and under, I don't trust you. There's. Well, it's funny. I think like the number of CEOs who are over six feet, it's, uh, I don't know if there's like Freakonomics or something. Most CEOs are over a certain height. Like, but that's like, just, like are short kings having a moment right now in Hollywood? Like well, the Tom guys, Hollins you know, and Timothy Chalamet's of the world? I'm going to introduce you both to Anthony Scaramucci if you want to get a <laughs> short guy that's having a moment. <laughs> yeah, uh, Jen, by the way, didn't realize that people measure time now in Scaramucci's. But. Yes, that is, that is absolutely <laughs> true. You know, if somebody lasts like five or six weeks, it'll be mm -hmm. like he lasted or she lasted six Scaramucci's. It's become yeah. quite funny. And Anthony has totally oh. embraced it, by the way. Okay, so commodities trading. You talked mm -hmm. a little bit about how that's where you started your path. If you had to give us the 101 on commodities trading, specifically with respect to gold, which I know is your specialty, what is the role of commodities trading desks within these institutions? And what historically is the role of gold in the macroeconomic World. Lots to unravel there. It's a great question. I, I encourage your viewers, listeners, to the extent that they've never seen it. I'm sure both you ladies have, but Trading Places is one of the great movies of all it's time. The, it was, I haven't it was seen my it. entire how impression of Kristen, Wall Street. How is that possible? That I know. But I say to her too. I know. I, I will. I'm, I'm going to watch it. No, we're going to do a review no. of the movie on our podcast for I the mean, uninitiated. That's a, that's a bit of a character flaw, by the way, but I'll let that it's one fair. slide because obviously both you ladies, Ivy League graduates, you don't need to sort of go lowbrow with some of these movies. <laughs> that movie would never get made today. But the end of that movie takes place on the floor of the New York Mercantile Exchange, Seven World Trade Center, and they filmed it on a Saturday. And it's Eddie Murphy and Dan Aykroyd yelling and screaming in the middle of this huge pit. And I think a lot of people will watch that and they'll be like, there's an absolutely no way that that's how people traded commodities back in the day. But I'm here to tell you that's exactly how commodities were traded to the extent that all those extras were actually guys, mostly men, some women that did that for a living on the floor. So what you see so cool. there is an accurate portrayal assessment 
of what commodity trading in the pit was like. And it was as close to being a professional athlete as I was going to get without obviously the contact. Although I will tell you, there was probably a fight or two every few days down there on the exchange. And it was a great learning environment in terms of how markets worked and in terms of just understanding how people worked and the ticks people have and the tells people have. So the best education I got in my world, in the Wall Street world, was the eight or nine months I spent on the floor of the exchange. Now, in terms of commodities trading, if you think about everyday life, I mean, our lives are driven by the prices of commodities. And we don't have to get too wonky here, but you fill up your car with gasoline, Mm -hmm. you go to the supermarket, you do any number of different things. And quite frankly, they're all driven by commodity prices, whether we realize that or not. So commodity trading, to a certain extent, is sort of the backbone of our economy. And the importance for a place like Drexel was we were one of the biggest trading desks in the firm in terms of what we were doing. Mm -hmm. And gold obviously was a huge component of that. And you asked me about the importance of gold. If you think about it, since the beginning of economies, central banks or a lot of governments have basically had gold as the backbone of their currency. And every developed economy in the history of mankind, effectively, to some extent, is reliant upon gold. And central banks, without getting completely in the weeds here, very quietly have been stockpiling their gold reserves over the last few years. And you're finally starting to see it manifest itself in the price. As we sit here, gold's basically trading at an all-time high. And I think that's telling you that maybe central banks, which have been very easy in terms of interest rate policies, Mm -hmm. have sort of run amok. And to a certain extent, their buying of gold is hedging their own ineptitude. Mm, So let's talk a little bit more about that, because we recently aired a couple of episodes about digital currencies and Mm -hmm. about DeFi and the emergence of cryptocurrencies, especially with the legitimization of Bitcoin through the recent approval of the ETF. And it's funny because some of the original theory about these digital currencies was digital gold, right? This is something that's going to have value, that it has intrinsic value versus monetary systems where we can literally print money. The money is only worth the paper that it's printed on, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm curious, gold as a risk asset Mm -hmm. or as a flight to quality asset. Can you talk a little bit about what the history of that has been? For example, if it's non-farm payroll Friday and the payroll report is terrible, what should gold do and why? That's that's a great, I appreciate that question. So let's try to break it down a little bit. Obviously, historically, gold has been a hedge for inflation. Now, people would say, well, wait a second. You know, when inflation was running amok a couple summers ago, why wasn't gold behaving? And Mm -hmm. the reason why is because the Fed basically told you that they're going to do whatever they have to do to combat inflation. So if the Mm -hmm. Fed's not on your side in terms of being a gold trader, obviously it's going to have an impact on the price. And that's what happened. But, Mm -hmm. you know, as inflation becomes sort of embedded in our economy and basically, you know, economies across the globe, you're starting to see gold pick up. So it is a store of value to a certain extent, and it is a bit of an inflation risk. But more importantly, I think it's a hedge against geopolitical risk, which is obviously huge and top of mind right now and front and center. Mm -hmm. And to a certain extent, as I mentioned before, as central banks sort of trip over themselves to be accommodative and try to support their economies, it's a hedge against, and Jen, you sort of alluded to it, fiat currencies and basically currencies Mm -hmm. that are backed by only the goodwill of the governments that are supporting them, which or the might of their militaries. Nothing. Yeah. <laughs> Bitcoin was created, I want to say 2008, 2009, yeah. in the midst of or in the aftermath of the great financial crisis. And I think whoever created it, it was a bet against central banks, which were no longer as relevant as history suggests. And I think to a certain extent, Bitcoin is a bet against central bankers and, again, the aforementioned fiat currencies. And if you go back and look real quick, and this will be an interesting exercise for your audience, it's not coincidental that the first time Bitcoin topped out was basically November, December of 2021, right around the same time our Federal Reserve decided that, you know, this zero interest rate policy was going to be no more and they were going to be on this path to normalization and raising Mm -hmm. interest rates. Yeah, I I really want to double click on something you said there about gold as an inflation hedge, because one of the things that's really interesting is that 
all of the different commodities markets, whether it be oil, whether it be cotton, whether it be corn, these all have functions for traditional hedgers and producers and end users. But gold kind of takes on a life of its own, mm-hmm. right? Separate from the rest of the metals and mining category. And I'm curious, from the standpoint of someone who's entering into the commodities trading world, how do you specialize? How do you become a gold specialist? Are you a metals and mining specialist and then you segue into gold? Or are you a macro trader and you trade gold as part of that portfolio? Yeah, great. Another great question. So I'll speak to my history. This is, again, 1986. There was a spot on the precious metals desk that they needed to fill. Mm -hmm. And so they planted my ass in a chair after nine months on the floor of the mercantile exchange in hopes that I would have some aptitude to do the job. I will tell you, people came and went. And the only reason I survived is I figured out early on that if they were going to fire me, they were going to do it. But I was going to put my head down and do my thing and try to navigate. So to answer your question specifically, at least back then, It was just an open seat. It could have been an open seat on the crude oil desk or on the currency desk as well. It just happened for me that was on the precious metals desk. I think today, commodities traders are a bit more specialized and maybe he or she focuses on something that is of interest to them. I know a lot of people today love currencies and the intricacies of trading different currencies against other currencies. For example, trading the dollar against the Japanese yen, those types of things. But In my world, it was just an empty seat, and they put my rear end in that seat. But in terms of (laughs) understanding, once you immerse yourself and you try to figure out who the players are, you know, it takes time, but you figure out things pretty quickly. And in the gold world, the players, again, were central banks. They were institutions, and they were wealthy individual investors. And I'll tell you this quick story. One of the biggest, and this is a good, I think, lesson for your listeners and viewers about betting on yourself and taking a chance in life. Drexel Burnham, one of our biggest clients on our desk was a gentleman named Sir James Goldsmith. He was one of the first corporate raiders, and he had a designated phone line on our desk. And just for illustration, on a trading desk, there are hundreds of different phone lines that come in, and he had a number that was solely his. So if that phone line rang, by definition, it had to be him because nobody else had the number. And there were two people on our desk that were allowed to speak to Sir James. As you can probably figure out, I was not one of those two people. (laughs) But on this particular day, both those guys were off the desk and the phone line rang and it was obviously him. Now, Uh back in the day, it was predominantly men, all type A assholes like me, a couple of women. But when that phone line rang, nobody moved. Everybody was a deer in the headlights. And at 23 or 24 years old, I said, you know what? If I don't pick up this phone... He's going to call Morgan Stanley. He's going to call Goldman Sachs. So that phone line can't ring twice. Like it cannot ring twice. Well, that's it. So I said, you know, I'm going to take a shot here. So I picked up the phone and the conversation went something like this. Hello, Brad. I said, no, Sir James, it's not Brad's off the desk. My name is Guy. How can I help you? He's like, well, you know, what's going on in the market today? And I sort of gave him an overview of what I thought was going on. But it was pretty clear that he had something else on his mind. So I'm like, Mm -hmm. okay, I'm going to sort of push the envelope here. And I said, Sir James... Sounds like you're troubled by something. He's like, funny, you should say that. He said, my daughter, Jemima, and you can go and Google this name, Jemima Goldsmith. She started dating this Pakistani cricket player, and I am not at all happy about it. I said, well, I'm sorry to hear that. I'm sure she'll figure it out on her own. Turns out the gentleman she was dating was Imran Khan, who went on to be the president of the premier of Pakistan. He was one of the great (laughs) cricket players. But I tell Uh that story because we had a lovely conversation, and in the months that passed, Sir James would call and ask for me, to the point where a year or so later, he says, you know what, guy, Jemima's still dating this guy. Would you come over to London and maybe take her to dinner? I'm like, Sir James, I got to say something. That's a bit out of my price range, but I appreciate it. But it's a fun story about betting on yourself and taking a shot because by picking up the phone- yes. You know, I took a chance, I bet on myself, and I developed a relationship with a guy that became one of the biggest clients of Drexel. And then subsequently, when I went to Goldman Sachs, one of the biggest clients there as well. That is an incredible story. Can you talk a little bit just about like relative value between the commodities? How does silver trade relative to gold or like copper? I mean, is there any kind of rhyme or reason to how other commodities trade relative to each other in the precious metal space? That's a great question, Kristen. I appreciate that. And let's just talk about gold and silver, which, you know, there's something, again, without going into the weeds here, 
but something we used to call the gold-silver ratio, and it's something that historically held up. So when gold got to a certain premium to silver, the history suggests that silver will catch up. But as we're sitting here today with gold effectively at an all-time high, silver's 50, 50% less than its all-time high. So those wow. ratios have not held up over the last year or so. So there are a lot of people out there that believe if gold is going to continue on this trajectory, by definition, silver is going to have to play catch up. But what I'll tell you is silver is a true commodity. Back in the day, for the, you fans of Kodak out there and people that develop film, mm -hmm. the biggest silver client in the world was effectively Kodak. Well, the world's changed, so silver's not as important of an industrial metal as it was. Obviously, gold's its own animal. In terms of copper, and I'm glad you mentioned copper. Is that more construction and home building? That, that's, like That's, that's a proxy for that, right? hundred percent. And we've seen recently this breakout to the upside. In other words, the price has been going higher in copper, which suggests a number of different things. But if copper is as important a metal to the economy as history suggests, the Federal Reserve, which thinks they have slayed this inflation dragon, and if you look at copper, copper is telling a much different story. Commodities, again, historically, they do have relations to one another, but those relationships lost some of the significance over the last couple of years. Well, and wow. when they become dislocated too, not to use too stupid of a pun here, but it can be the canary in the coal mine, if you will, mm. for, hey, maybe something's going on here beyond just what the Fed is telling us or what stocks are telling us, right? And well, if you, you think about for your listeners and viewers, you watch any time the inflation report comes out and they'll march out these different pundits from whatever administration, it doesn't matter. This is not political. They'll take victory laps about how they're slaying the inflation dragon or they're winning the fight against inflation, which is patently false. For a lot of people, they'll say to themselves, what are you talking about? And what people say is the number comes down. It doesn't mean inflation is coming down. It means inflation is not growing as fast as it was prior. So it's still growing, the speed of which is not as fast as it was. So a 3% inflation rate doesn't mean it's down from four to three. It means it's just growing less fast, which again, might sound sort of nuanced. It's not intended to be. The cumulative effect under the Biden administration of inflation is almost now 20%. And people, again, buying groceries or paying insurance or medical bills, they know firsthand that they can tell us in that inflation has been slayed, but the reality is it's anything but. Right. Well, and I think yeah. there's also a key distinction between what measures of inflation the Fed is monitoring and talking about and what you're feeling every day as a layperson walking around America. These episodes don't air in real time, but this will air sometime in 2024, <laughs> and this is an election year. And you talked a little bit about whatever political environment we're in. The Fed is a political animal, whether people want to recognize that or not. I, I heard you talk about this a little bit on your show last week about Powell's sense of obligation in an election year. And I'm curious how you think that's materializing. When we went into the year, we were pricing in five or six rate cuts. Yeah. And the Fed said, uh-uh, not happening. You guys are way too exuberant about this. And now they've said, well, it's going to be three, right? Like, oh, okay, this is happening. But how does all of that fit into the broader political spectrum more generally Great question. Speaking? And I'll try to answer it as apolitical as I possibly can. But, you know, earlier this year, Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders. <laughs> what did you say, Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders? I don't think you can be too apolitical. <laughs> Well, I mean, I only bring them up because, you know, they sent an open letter to Jerome Powell, the Fed chair, saying, right. hey, interest rates are too high. You have to start cutting in a meaningful way as quickly as possible. And that's political. I mean, in terms yeah. of I understand that that might be politically expedient, but that's quite frankly, the, probably the worst thing they can do for the people they represent, because mm -hmm. by lowering those rates, all that's going to happen is the inflation, which is a problem for the lower and middle class. It's just going to get that much worse. And in terms mm -hmm. of answering your question about a political entity, you know, I think Jerome Powell's been pretty clear. He wants to sort of remove himself from that and take himself out of that equation. And I take him at his word. Of course, the problem is whatever he's going to do or not do is going to be viewed through a political lens. So if he starts right. to cut rates in a meaningful way, the Republicans will say, see that he's doing this ahead of an election to help the Biden administration. And if he doesn't do it, the Democrats are going to say he's not helping us at all. He's hamstringing us. He's helping the other side. So 
he's screwed either way. But as Shakespeare <laughs> said, you know, uneasy is the head yeah. that wears the crown or something like that. Mm-hmm. Two more quick questions on commodities. So you were talking about how like in trading places, which again, I obviously have not seen. Which is that a they're problem, like, as I mentioned. Before. I know, so I know, I know. you bring it up, I'll just Don't reiterate. let her off the hook. That's right. <laughs> I mean, everyone has like, even if you haven't seen that, the picture of people yelling across New York Stock Exchange, how much has the actual environment on the floor of some of these places gotten tamer or has it, as I assume everything's getting more electronic? Like how Ooh, have things changed? And part two of that, what's the difference between the NYMEX trading floor and the commodities trading floor at say a Goldman Sachs? Yeah. Because some people may not understand the difference. So the first part from Kristen's question is, have things gotten tamer? Absolutely. I mean, the world's gotten tamer. And what we used to happen in the 80s, by almost by definition, legally can't happen today. As I mentioned, <laughs> you know, there'd be fistfights, not on a daily basis, but pretty frequently enough where it was concerning at a certain point. And I'm not a small person. You know, I probably go 6'2", 210-ish. But back then in the day, I was probably medium sized. And I I tell this story all the time in terms of the size of these individuals. There was one day that was on my phone. And back then there were phones with long cords that would reach 15 or 20 feet in case you had to walk into the ring to tell your broker something. And again, (laughs) I'm on the phone with the trading desk and I'm relaying messages from the traders on the floor to the people trading the stuff upstairs in different offices. And One day I got too close to somebody's spot and I feel hands on my shoulders and then I feel my feet get lifted off the floor and then moved. And I'm like, holy shit, what is that? Who is this animal? And I turn around and it's a guy named Rich Rizik. And now Rich passed away probably five or six years ago, but Rich was about 6'7", 285, played football at Columbia had a cup of coffee in the NFL and wound up being one of the top commodities traders at Goldman Sachs. But for a period mm-hmm. of time, he was a floor trader on the floor of the New York Mercantile Exchange. And I got in Rich's spot and he picked me up and moved me. I'm like, oh my God, I mean, these people are animals. So that's what the environment was like down there. Now that's changed a lot. And with the advent of electronic trading, to a certain extent, the jobs that existed 25 or 30 years ago don't exist now. In terms Mm -hmm. of the difference between a floor trader and the traders upstairs on the desks of different investment banks, the floor traders had a very specific role. They were trading on the futures exchange and they were looking at and monitoring futures prices. The traders upstairs on the desk were not only monitoring the futures prices, but were also trying to figure out what's going on in the quote unquote cash market or the market that's trading in the here and the now as opposed to the futures markets. And they were trying to take advantage of the price discrepancies or the arbitrage. And you can go to your Google machine and check that out (laughs) that existed between the futures price and the cash price. And they were trading upstairs with all those different clients, like a Sir James Goldsmith, who I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what do those roles look like now? If you work at the NYMEX mm-hmm. now, what are you doing? We read Going Infinite by Michael Lewis, yeah. and he talked about – did you read that book? Yeah. Um, you know, there's that great passage where he talks about the physicality, which is something you've talked about a lot here, of the traders shifting in real time, right? That there was this visual manifestation of how the role was changing, that yeah. you – Needed to be a guy, Adami, 6'2", 210, shouting over all these other guys, physically jockeying for a position to build dominance in the space back in the day. And now the stature, the composure, the volume of traders has visibly shifted as everything becomes more electronic. So what are these guys on the NYMEX doing all day? Yeah, it's not, the world has changed considerably. And most people will say for the better, you know, I'd push back a little bit, Neanderthal notwithstanding, it was a really interesting time and the markets were extraordinarily efficient now, but it's, it's sort of be careful what you wish for because I think people were longing for an environment where you didn't need animals and Neanderthals like me yelling and screaming and buying and selling different things. You could move to a platform that was traded electronically and take sort of the human element out of the equation. And that's what we got. And not only on the floor of the mercantile exchange, but the Chicago Board of Trade and some of the other things, and quite frankly, the New York Stock Exchange, where they're probably one fifteenth or one twentieth of the amount of people on the floor now than mm-hmm. they were sort of in the heyday in the eighties and nineties, and that's just because of the advent of technology and and electronic trading and the different things that exist. So, 
maybe it's more efficient. I'm not quite certain. Maybe it's allowed more people to, um, I don't know, tap into or be part of those markets. But, you know, there's a faction of people out there, myself included, that long for that bygone past where you know, things were a lot more interesting. And markets, mm -hmm. it was a way to learn markets in something you couldn't get out of a textbook or couldn't yes. get just sort of in terms of talking to somebody. You had to physically mm -hmm. experience and understand how markets truly worked. I, yeah. this, this goes back. It's so funny. Cause we get asked all the time, like how is AI and everything going to change what people do in finance? And I do think there is so much that by being there, you develop this intuition that like the next generation is just not going to have. And I mean, I used to always talk about how I go teach you how to build a three statement financial model and actually being in Excel and building it. You're learning all these things about accounting, about companies, about how one thing affects the, the next thing. And sure AI can do it, but it's like, you as a person are now not going to be learning that intuition that the act of building something does. And same thing with sitting there and just absorbing like, oh, wow, this is how everything is moving. And so I don't know. I, I think it is a little bit kind of sad. No, Kristen, <laughs> let me amplify that and give me about a minute or so to try yeah. to explain this. So on the floor of these different exchanges, the, the traders in these pits, there were different types of traders. There were traders that worked for Goldman Sachs, for JP Morgan. There were traders that worked for very specific commodity companies. There were some traders down there that were working on behalf of energy companies or different agricultural companies. And then there were other guys, and I say guys because they were mostly men that traded for their own accounts, okay? And they were called locals. And in terms of the market, you'd be like, how can the market be efficient when you have tens, dozens, 50, 60 different people yelling and screaming and trading with each other. And I'll try to give you a brief explainer as to why it worked. If a local, for example, let's just call him Tom. If Tom bought something from my trader, let's just call him Rich, at $15. And at the end of the day, that instrument or commodity or orange juice future that he bought at $15 closed at $14. So Tom was out of the money a dollar. At the end of the day, we all reconcile with each other. And Tom's clerk would come up to me and say, Tom didn't buy that contract from you at $15. He doesn't know anything about it. And I'd ask DK's my the broker train. <laughs> and Rich would say, no, he absolutely did. And Tom would be adamant. No, I did not. And so this is what would happen. I'd say, okay, that's fine. We don't know that trade either. So we'd let Tom off the hook. You know what would happen the next day? Nobody in the effing ring would trade with Tom. So it was a self-policing thing. Tom had one shot to get over on somebody. And then for the remainder of his career, nobody was going to trade with him, effectively put him out of business. It was self-policing in that manner. Now you could say, oh my God, that's really harsh. Well, no, I mean, that's how efficient markets work. And to your point about AI and the change in the world, we're never going to put that genie back in the bottle, but there's a lot to be said for the learning experience around taking ownership in those different types of things back in the 80s and early 90s. I love that story. And it's funny. I remember when the iPhone came out or whatever, I was like, I've got a great idea for an ad for Apple. You show all the great movies of history, right? And all the big conflicts. It's like someone's lost and you can't find them. Or like there's a miscommunication between these two lovers and whatever. And it's like, Nothing interesting is ever going to happen in the movies anymore because, well, you just look up the directions on your phone mm -hmm. or you just have a text message or you go back through the thing. And I remember, I don't know if you recall, there was actually like a minor earthquake that was felt in New York City. This must have been, I don't know, 2011, 2012. I was sitting on the trading floor at Morgan Stanley and I thought just like, you know, there were some big dudes walking around on the trading floor <laughs> and we were on the second floor. So occasionally the floor would shake and my seat's rattling and I suddenly realized it's not just some big dude walking behind me. There's no one walking behind me. There's an earthquake. And Chris Rokos who, for those of you who don't know, so Brevin Howard is an acronym of the portfolio managers who started the fund. And Chris Rokos is the R called up the desk and everyone's kind of freaking out or whatever. And I picked up the phone. I didn't even cover him. And he said, make me a two way in a yard of tens or mm -hmm. whatever it was. This is a voice trade. I have to stand up and say it to the treasury trader across from me who's sitting there, turns white at a sheet, has to calm himself down and calmly make this two way market that could, you know, basically bankrupt the firm if there's really an earthquake in New York and these buildings are going to start coming down or if it's nothing, right? Which it obviously was. 
And watching that interaction go down, what I learned about human nature, how everyone reacted to it, how the markets reacted to it, all of that, thinking about watching that movie, I want to watch that movie. Thinking about everyone just sitting at their desk and going, da 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 no one's facial expression changing, mm-hmm. nothing happening, a bunch of video game sounds going on and off or whatever. That's not the human story. That's not the history that I want to be a part of. And I think mm-hmm. that something is so lost in the lack of that interaction. And whenever we talk about those kind of trade executions that I used to do all the time, which now basically don't exist, certainly in the cash markets anymore, sometimes they do in the derivatives markets, it's a very different world. And like you said, I'm not sure it's the world that I would want to learn and grow up in and 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 be in. Well, that's a great story without question. I totally understand what you're saying in terms of understanding and learning from people and the emotion and the body language. And if you think about, for example, a poker table, some of the great poker players are people that can read the body language of the guys or gals sitting across from them. And the advent of poker played on your phones, I mean, a lot of that mm-hmm. is lost Some of the best players are still the ones that can sit at a table and identify what's going on. And to a certain extent, some of the best traders out there are still the ones that can look around the arena and try to figure out who's positioned in what way and how he or she can take advantage of that. And that's Mm -hmm. something, quite frankly, unless I'm completely missing something, that technology is never going to be able to sort of encapture. No, Mm -hmm. I don't think so at all. Okay, so you talked about then migrating from a role in commodities Mm -hmm. over to trading at Goldman Sachs, where I understand you were on the equities, sales, and trading floor. (coughs) We have barely touched on that at all. I came from a fixed income sales and trading background. Kristen came from that, as well as an investment banking standpoint. Can you talk a little bit about what your role was like as an equities trader, how that division of the firm brings money in, and how that has evolved over the past couple of years as well? So indulge me again, if you may, for a couple of minutes. Commodity trading at Goldman Sachs, or commodity trading in general, in the late 90s, there was nothing really interesting going on. Gold market was not particularly interesting. Wasn't a lot going on in the energy markets. But obviously, equities were exploding, if you think mm-hmm. about it. And internally at Goldman Sachs, they were starting to poach people to go to the equities desk. And I was one of the people that sort of was asked, would you be interested? And then, yeah, I said, you know what? Fine. So I went from 85 Broad Street, which was the headquarters of Goldman Sachs, to uh, one New York Plaza, which, by the way, I think was the building they modeled Towering Inferno or something. That building was was so gross. It was a big, yeah, it was a shithole of a building. But, you know, in the commodities world, I didn't have to take any of those series tests, series 7, 55, 63. It was a whole different animal in commodities. And when you went to equities, obviously, you needed all those different licenses. So I spent the first few months over there getting these tests under my belt and they were a complete pain in the ass. And I yep. feel bad for anybody that's currently going through that. But you said something earlier, Jen, about making a two way market. And oh, yeah. in the commodities world, that's what we did. If Sir James Goldsmith called up or if anybody called up, they weren't going to tell you if they were buying something or selling something. They weren't telling you what their intent was. They were asking you to make them a price where they could sell to you or buy from you. And that's what the commodities world was. When I went to the equity world, it was entirely different. Mm -hmm. Customers would call us up and say they wanted to buy something or they wanted to sell something. And we didn't have to risk anything on our end. We just had to basically execute an order on their behalf. And they would pay us to do that. Not only would they pay us, they would pay us a lot to the extent six cents a share, which doesn't sound like a lot. But when you're trading tens of millions of shares a day, it adds up really quick. And I would look around and I'd say to myself, what is going on here? Because You got paid a fixed fee on each regardless of, wow. I Honestly, this is brand new information to me, especially coming from a fixed income background where there's risk taking involved well, in everything. A, and it is an a commission model. And that's why people from our world, the fixed income, com- currency and commodities people had such a difficult time understanding like exactly why people were paying us. So I asked somebody. And why we look down on equities people, fixed income people are always such snobs. (laughs) Well, and and rightly so, because you're out there, you know, you're fucking Captain Ahab trying to kill the white whale. And you're getting, (laughs) and these people are, you know, sitting around hanging out and getting paid to basically execute orders. Pardon my earlier French. But I'll say this. I asked somebody, I said, I have to ask you a question. 
why do we get paid the amount of money we get paid to execute orders? And they say, oh, that's easy. They're paying for our calendar, which basically is talking about the IPO calendar and their ability to access mm -hmm. shares on IPOs, initial public offerings. They're paying us for our research, mm -hmm. which, okay, fine. And they're also paying us for the few times that we call them up and say, hey, you need to take the risk off our hands. In other words, bid wanted on 5 million shares of General Electric. And for those three reasons, they felt it worthy to pay us that amount of money. So when I went over there, I'm like, well, I will tell you flat out, this is not going to last. And I might have been a bit early, but that six cents a share is now, I don't even know what it is, but it's tenths of pennies in terms of the commissions. And in a world where machines are dominating, those jobs really don't exist in the same way they did before. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the equities division was a huge driver of revenue for a long time. You know, I don't want to say it's gone away, but let's put it this way. It's changed considerably. So is there still a risk yes. element to it, though? Is there a risk taking element? Because you talked about that bid wanted scenario where mm -hmm. you are taking down a chunk of risk and it's not going to be just a limit order book. Can you talk a little bit about how the desk took and takes risk in those scenarios? It's a great question. So when you have these larger desks and the different people on the desk, for example, Kristen might be covering five or six different clients. Jen might be covering five or six different clients. So all of a sudden, somebody came in, bid wanted 10 million shares of, let's just say, American Airlines, for example, because mm -hmm. something was happening in the space. Or Boeing is a good example. I was going to say, yeah. Boeing's been in the news. <laughs> and so you would look around and say, okay, I know that Jen's client a week ago was buying Boeing shares. I know that Kristen's client two days ago was buying Boeing shares. So I'd stand up on the desk or this, we have this speaker system where you would alert people that, okay, bid wanted 10 million shares of Boeing and people would go out to their clients and, you know, solicit interest as to would they be willing to buy Boeing at a certain price? So You'd have to make these prices very quickly, but you also have an understanding as to who the players might be that could take the other side. But to answer okay. your original question, you would take risk. And once that client bought or sold to you those shares, then you were on the hook for any price fluctuations or price movements. But it happened more frequently 20 years ago. I still think mm -hmm. it happens, but not nearly to the extent that it happened many years ago. Got it. Okay. And- it seems like there were two distinct elements. There was this deal access, right? The mm -hmm. calendar that you talked about. And then this smaller, but still important risk-taking element yeah. of, of market making. Okay, got it. They and were paying are, you because mm -hmm. basically what they were saying is, we're willing to pay you this amount of money because we know at some point we're going to jam you up with something. And uh -huh. the amount of money we're paying you over the course of the years that jam up will be mitigated by those commission dollars that we're paying you. I'm oversimplifying, but that to a certain yeah. extent is exactly what's going on. Are, are you guys like super plugged in with prime brokerage? Like for people when they want to short, how does that kind of Th work? That's another great <laughs> question. I don't know exactly where they sat at the time. And now we're sort of getting into the advanced classes of uh, equity trading, but that's okay. We're doing 101 and 102 right now. If somebody wants to bet on something going lower, in other words, Jen thinks that Boeing, which is, let's say, is currently trading $200, is going to trade to $150. And she wants to short that stock or bet against it effectively. In order to do that, she has to borrow the shares. In other words, she has to have access to those shares to short them. And there's a desk that handles that. So yes, Kristen, to answer your question, you would have, I wouldn't say day-to-day -day interactions with that desk, but when those different situations came up, obviously you'd sort of be linked into what they were doing. Mm -hmm. Got it. And just to piggyback on that, so whenever you're going to short something, you can't just say, "Okay, I don't, I don't have any." You can't do a to naked short. Exactly. You no need naked to shorts. Have identified the shares that you are going to borrow, and then if the price goes down, you then you're buy them back. Yeah, exactly, mm -hmm. at a lower price. If you were to give us the skinny on what's going on in the equities markets right now, trying to keep it as jargon free, I feel like all we ever hear about is the Magnificent Seven. Mm -hmm. All we ever hear about is NVIDIA, NVIDIA and tech yeah. stocks. I'm over it. But what is 
your view right now on what the and again this is march 25th 2024 this episode might air in june for all we know hopefully it won't but what would you hope if you were interviewing young people coming into the industry right now that they could be conversant in and what topics would you want them to be thoughtful about Obviously, we all sort of lived through COVID in various different ways. The markets survived COVID in a meaningful way. And I think what participants have come to understand is the equity markets are seemingly impervious to bad news. And what does that mean? It means, yeah, maybe over the course of a couple of days, a couple of weeks, things will look dire, but the equity markets are basically lower left to upper right. And what does that mean? Well, think about what lower left to upper right looks like. And that's the trajectory of a lot of these stock prices. And that's what we've seen to a large extent. So I think people have come to the conclusion is the bad days are opportunities to continue to buy stocks because they're not going to last. And there's this sense of this basically self-perpetuating equity market that's going to go up in perpetuity. And that's been, quite frankly, the right course of action. Of course, if you've been around for a period of time, you understand that that's not necessarily the case. And there's always going to be some exogenous event or something that nobody's taken into consideration that can derail that. For a lot of the younger people out there that have watched their stocks go up 5, 10, 15 X and have enjoyed these runs thinking that this is normal, I will tell you what we've seen over the last three and a half or four years, there's nothing normal about it. And anecdotally, very quickly, you mentioned today's date, March 25th. People can go back three Fridays ago and look, NVIDIA, which... The market cap, the worth of NVIDIA was north of $2.3 trillion, which made it one of the largest companies in the history of the world. There was a certain Friday that the company from peak to trough lost in market cap almost $250 billion. Now, we throw those numbers around like they're nothing anymore. But for context, I think there are only 60 companies in the world Mm-hmm. that are that size in the first place. And mm-hmm. in the course of a couple hours, from peak to trough, NVIDIA lost that. And people think there's somehow normalcy in that. I'm here to tell you there's nothing normal about it. How much yeah. of this exuberance is a function of the central bank action over the past 15 years of a belief that the Fed's always going to bail me out and therefore am I in QE, whatever, one, yeah. two, three, four, eight, ten, 10, well, infinity? I was going to add that slash how much of it is also everybody hears these days, just put your money into an ETF. So everything yeah. you earn, you just stick it into an ETF. So it's just like tons of money just piling in there. Huge, okay. huge so volume. Try, of I'm going to synthesize in. both those questions. I'm going to try to answer it in one way. So Jen's point about largesse of central banks, there's this belief that there's this safety net below us in terms of our federal reserve specifically, and that if things go to shit, It's not going to last long because the federal bank will be there to bail us out. And that obviously is going to change the trajectory of equity prices. And quite frankly, if you go back to March, April, May of 2023, when Silicon Valley blew up, there was a period of about a week or so where market participants were concerned only to have Mm -hmm. basically the Fed and Treasury come in and say, hey, guess what? You no longer need to be concerned. So that one instance, actually, those small and regional bank blowups of last year, in a lot of ways, were probably the best thing that happened to the market. And I think it mm-hmm. reemphasized and galvanized this belief that the powers that be are not going to let equity markets go down for too long a period of time. And then to Kristen's point, this advent of passive investing, where money flows into the equity markets, regardless of news, where you just have money flows each and every day, those two things together a very powerful force for the market. And that's one of the reasons why seemingly the market goes up every single day, almost without exception. Passive investing won. And this belief, misguided or not, that the central bank, specifically our Federal Reserve, is going to have our collective backs. And do you agree? (laughs) I agree that passive investing is certainly an aspect of that. My concern has always been when passive becomes active, it's never active on the way up. And when active Mm -hmm. kicks in, it's typically when things start to go down. And there's this old saying in our world, the commodities world, that the market takes the stairs up and the elevator Elevator down. down. You can sort of think about (laughs) that. The express elevator. (laughs) And the express elevator. And in terms of the central banks, yeah, I do believe there's this belief that they have our back. But at some point, 
the market collectively is going to call bullshit. And to our <laughs> earlier conversation, I think that's why Bitcoin was created with this sense that there'll be a day where central banks will try to step in and it's just not going to work. Mm -hmm. In our lifetime, we've always had kind of like a few laws of the universe. And one of those has finally been broken and it's uh, the Bank of Japan. And I'm curious. Oh, look at to, you going deep like, here. Well, I'm curious what that looks like from your standpoint and what you think that means for macro traders. You talked about FX pairs. Dollar yen is one of the most important FX pairs that we have in the entire lexicon. What do you think happens next? Yes, I'm, I'm somewhat qualified to talk about this because for the first time in 17 years, the Bank of Japan raised interest rates, albeit at a very nominal pace or nominal uh, clip, but they raised them nonetheless. And it wasn't a surprise necessarily. It's something that's probably long overdue, but they did it. Of course, the problem is historically when central banks raise rates, it should be positive for your underlying currency. In other words- Ooh, Why, 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 why? Well, I mean, if you think about it, they're raising rates to try to combat and number of different things which are detrimental to the currency. So if you start to raise rates, by definition, it should be positive for your currency. And listen, that happened with the U.S. dollar. You know, the U.S. dollar is under considerable pressure until the Fed, our Federal Reserve, went on this rate hike cycle. And then, then obviously our U.S. dollar got on its horse against a number of different currencies. Of course, the problem here is Japan specifically, the weakness in the yen continues. So the dollar strength against the yen has continued despite the fact that the Bank of Japan raised rates. And maybe it's a differential thing, as you said, Jen, but there's going to be a bit of a currency crisis cropping up in the form of what's going on in the Japanese yen, because if it continues to weaken, it's going to have a deleterious effect on their consumer, their populace. And I think we're starting to see hints of it around the edges. And I think that's a story that not enough people are talking about, the potential for a currency crisis in Japan and what the Bank of Japan is going to have to do to defend their currency, the yen. What do you think that looks like? Well, it means probably selling different assets, maybe selling U.S. treasuries, which if they were to sell U.S. treasuries, put upward pressure on U.S. interest rates. So mm -hmm. you could have a series of, you know, whether intended or non intended consequences on the back of what the Japanese are going to have to do if their currency continues to weaken in a very dramatic fashion. Do you think that would just lead to continued curve steepening in the U.S. then if you're going to have a Fed that's going to be more dovish and you've got supply coming into the long end from foreign central banks liquidating? Another great question. From now until the end of this year, I think we have to raise somewhere between nine and ten trillion dollars of paper that's expiring. Basically, to fund our economy, all this paper that's been rolling over is going to roll over in a meaningful way. And people have to buy that debt. So we'll put out these different treasury auctions where our treasury auctions off debt to restock the treasury. And in order to do so, the markets can demand, I think, a higher rate of payment in order to buy that debt. There'll always be a buyer of U.S. debt. The question is, at what rate will they buy it? And I think the markets can demand higher interest rates. They're taking more risk. By taking more risk, they're going to demand higher rates, which is one of the reasons I think rates go higher in this country, not lower. So you have higher rates with a dovish Fed. That gets messy. Yeah, it gets really <laughs> messy because, you know, the Federal Reserve controls the front end of the yield curve. That's yeah. it. They don't control anything mm -hmm. else. And I think there's this belief that they can control the entire curve and they don't. And as we're sitting here today, that inverted yield curve. Again, I'm not trying to make your people's eyes glaze over. No, we've talked about it. We've covered the 101s of the yield curve. We can do it. It's the longest inversion in the history. I think it has now surpassed the period of time between 1978 and 1980, I believe. And wow. history will tell you that it's not the inversion that gets you, it's the re-steepening. And the fact that we've been mm -hmm. inverted this long, when things do start to steepen at some point, that's when people should start to be concerned. Again, not that I'm an economist, I'm not smart enough nor humorless enough to be one, but <laughs> history suggests that that's when things start to get a little dicey. Well, I think what's the stat? Every inverted yield curve has preceded a recession by 18 to 36 months, and here we are. So where's our recession? Well, and is it going to be a hard landing or a soft landing? Here we are, and what I didn't take into complete consideration was 
the amount of money that's been sloshing around the system still. So mm -hmm. that needed to sort of make its way through. And I think that's one of the reasons why you hear these long tails. In other words, you know, the reason why the long and variable lags of Fed action has been far longer than I think a lot of people thought. It doesn't mean they're not going to happen, but it probably didn't take into consideration, again, the amount of money that was thrown in the system on the back of COVID and all the different programs that were implemented. Say more. What, what do you mean about the money sloshing around the system? You well, mean if the you money think, supply? Think about, you mean th cash on the sidelines? Think about, forget about cash on the sidelines. Think about all the money that made its way into the system in the form of, you know, effectively handouts through mm -hmm. COVID. I mean, that money is still making its way Mm. through the system, sort of velocity of money type of thing, yeah. the speed with which Ooh, money can you makes explain, its way. Can you explain <laughs> velocity of money? We haven't talked about that yet. Well, it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not necessarily the amount of money in the system. It's the speed with which money makes its way through the system that's important. And that's obviously what we've seen, which is one of the reasons I think equity markets specifically has done as well as they have. And one of the reasons why I think inflation continues to sort of be a dragon or problem for the Federal Reserve. It's when the money slows down and credit is less available. That's when you start to have to get concerned. So I think we're cycling to the speed with which money is moving around the system and the lack of speed that it's going to start to move around the system in the form of credit. Can I ask you two more questions? Because we never get enough markets people on this, and I'm so excited to talk to a markets person. Jen's um, like giddy. <laughs> What do you think that these impending credit conditions and this kind mm -hmm. of investment crisis that's looming mean for the private equity boom that we saw over the past 15 years and the private credit markets as all of those people who took out all this debt in this really favorable borrowing and lending environment have to now refi that debt? And everyone's rushing to enter into the private credit markets, thinking that they're going to be able to take advantage of all these people having to refi under much, much, much tighter lending Well, that, that's a great, you know, as bank lending standards get tighter and availability mm -hmm. of credit gets less and less, which I think is going to start to happen. And you're seeing it. If you see some of these credit reports, it's clear bank lending is contracting. OK, mm -hmm. but. You know, the great thing about our economy is something will fill that void. And what's going to fill that void comes in the form of exactly what you just said, private credit and private equity. That's the good news. The bad news is they're going to take their pound of flesh on the way to do so. So the rates with which people will be able to borrow from historic lenders like banks and small yeah. and regional banks are going to be, it's going to be there, but it's going to be there at a higher rate of interest, which if you think about it, hurts margins, hurts hiring, theoretically, you know, you should start to see a, I don't know, there should be some snapback effect in terms of the higher rate of interest companies have to pay and what it means to their margins and then subsequently what it means to employment in this country. So that's a long thing, but I think you're starting to see that play out. And quite frankly, I think 30 states in this country are now in contraction. I think some ridiculous number... I think 35 states or so or close to 40 states are now seeing significant upticks in their unemployment rate. And if you look at our employment numbers that have come out, yeah, unemployment is still below 4%, but the revisions to each prior month have been negative now, I think 10 out of the last 12 months. And at a certain point, that's going to catch people off guard. I think the story that not enough people are talking about, I think, it's going to be the rise in the unemployment rate this year in a very significant, precipitous fashion. Well, I think so many of the seasonals around that were just broken after COVID and nobody realized it. I, I think that that's a big part mm -hmm. of that story. But so do you think like TLDR that the private credit guys are going to eat the private equity guys lunch? <laughs> <laughs> that's what it feels like. I'm not that. going to start making bets on who's <laughs> going to steal whose lunch money. But it's, you know, but if you think about it, if you look at the Apollos and the Carlisles yeah. and these different places, they're in a really good spot right now in terms of the landscape and how they've positioned their collective selves. So, you know, I, I think, listen, it's clear that the large banks continue to get larger. There's a reason why JP Morgan trades at such a premium and is effectively trading at its all time high, as opposed to some of these small and regional banks that can't get mm -hmm. out of their own way. And then other banks sort of in the middle, like the Wells and the Bank of America's and the cities that are hamstrung by some legacy stuff. So the big banks, we wanted too big to fail. But if you think about it, what's happened over the last year and a half since Silicon Valley Bank, 
effectively, we've just created the same thing. I mean, some of these yeah. banks are absolutely too big to fail. So, mm -hmm. you know, in trying to combat that, we've actually created a worse situation. Not to suggest that JP Morgan's in any bit of a dilemma, but they've obviously gotten much bigger over the last year, year and a half. Well, they the had to absorb regional the banks body, body. That, Yeah. <laughs> They had to take on their portfolios when everyone else went out of business. Well, that's, yes, that's exact. They had to, or they were sort of waiting in the weeds and able, you know, mm -hmm. to do exactly that. And, you know, Jamie Dimon is probably the most important banker in the world. I mean, if you listen to some of his commentary over the last year, I mean, he's pointing to a lot of things that we're sort of addressing in this conversation. Like there's some things under the surface that not a lot of people or let's put it this way, that the equity market seemingly is veiling or hiding. Mm. Okay. Can we switch gears here a little bit? So you talked rodeo, a lot. Sister. We now know mm. your height and weight. So I feel like we, <laughs> we're we getting really close on this podcast. You have a pretty serious history as a competitive athlete. <laughs> and you've, run an, you've done an Ironman. Like, yeah. I, I mean, I, I would like for you to talk a little bit about that because there is so much overlap between mm -hmm. competitive athletes and people who are successful on Wall Street for one reason or another. I'd like for you to talk about that a little bit. I mean, it's funny. You talk about the Goldman Commodities desk. All the wrestlers I knew from college, they basically transplanted them onto different desks yeah. around Wall Street, different teams. Which lacrosse team is running which trading desk at which firm? Can you talk a little bit about your experience as a competitive athlete and how you kept that up throughout your career yeah. too, even at later stages? That's a, I appreciate that question. So when I speak at colleges and stuff or speak at high schools or parent groups, and I believe this to be true, I think the greatest gift you can give your child is a gift of failure. And in failure comes suffering, but in suffering comes sort of an understanding that you can persevere. And we've gotten mm -hmm. away from that. And you know, in terms of being a competitive athlete, I mean, it's understanding failure. It's also understanding how to be, you know, persistence, the importance of persistence resilience. And, and resilience. Yeah. And I think that's what, that's why I think, at least in the old world of trading, I think athletes did so well because they had that resilience and they understood that, you know, unless your name is Tom Brady, you're going to lose things. <laughs> and he wasn't even time. that good. When he was in college, he was like, what, a seventh round draft pick he, he, or something? He was like the seventh or eighth string quarterback at Michigan. Yeah. And he sort of, he navigated his way through it. But again, resilience and persistence. But, you know, in terms of the Iron Man, and again, I'll tell the story quickly. One of my dear friends, a gentleman named John Highland, he has now I survived cancer mean. five different times. And the first time that he lived through it, he lived through something called AML, which at the time of his... Um, when he was diagnosed, there was a 16% survival rate. So when he got on the other side of that, he asked me to join him on the board of the Leukemia Society. And the first meeting that we had was on a Thursday, I believe. And somebody at the end of the meeting stood up and said, to raise money, I've been doing different triathlons. And I found that people were responding to it. And this was a cancer survivor himself. Now, as fate would have it, two days earlier on the set of Fast Money, we had the three gentlemen on, the lead guy was a guy named John Korf, who were going to put on the first ever New York City Ironman in August of 2012. And this was oh. sometime in early 2011 when we had this meeting. And I spoke to John and we exchanged business cards. So, of course, the light bulb goes off in my head at our board meeting for the Leukemia Society. So at the end of the meeting, I went to our director and said, for what it's worth, I just met the three guys who are going to do the Ironman in New York next summer. I said, I bet if I ask, I could get the Leukemia Society, our group, spots. Because these events typically sell out in about 10 minutes. And the New York City Ironman sold out in about that amount of time. So there were no spots available. Stacy said, that would be great if you could do that. I called up John Korf. I said, John, I'm on the board of the Leukemia Society. Can I get 10 spots? Absolutely. And there's this saying in life, no good deed goes unpunished. <laughs> so Stacy said, you know what, guy, that's great. But we've been thinking, you know, why don't you put together the team for it? Now, at the time, I was 48 years old. I was probably weighed two and a quarter. I would get out of breath walking up a flight of stairs. You know, everybody thinks they can swim. Everybody thinks they could bike. <laughs> Not the, the Hudson River. <laughs> an Ironman is a 2.4 mile open water swim, 112 mm -hmm. mile bike, and then a marathon, 26.2 miles. So 
it dawned on me that like, you know what? There's a reason I met John and there's a reason why I just joined Luke. So I said, yeah, fuck it. I'll do it. So I spent the next eight or nine months whittling myself down and you'd be amazed at what you can do if you put your mind to it. I got my resting heart rate down to about 48 or some stupid nice. number. Wow. And I did it. But, you know, you mentioned the Hudson River. Mm-hmm. For those that live in this area, it's not the most pristine body of water. And three days prior to the Ironman, there was a raw sewage spill in Terrytown, New York. Stop. And they were <laughs> contemplating eliminating that portion of the, the uh, event. Fortunately, wow. they didn't. And that actually proved to be the highlight of my day. Because I was on the bike for approximately eight hours. Oh, my God. And I finished it in 16 hours and 19 minutes. You're like, I've been on the floor of the NYMEX swimming through raw sewage is the highlight of my day. How did you find the time to train for that? How many hours a day were you training? You know, you mentioned about why Wall Street is sort of littered with men and women that played competitive sports or did individual sports. And, again, it's sort of figuring out had a budget and I would yeah. get on a bike trainer late at night in my basement and wow. sit and spin for a couple hours. And I'd get up early in the morning and go to a mountain lakes for folks that know the area. You know, I'd get up at four thirty five and go swim back and forth in the lake and you just figure it out. But what I'll tell you is, and this is a true story. I didn't run at all in the lead up to the Ironman. I figured that if I made it to the marathon portion, <laughs> Oh I would just sort of gut my way through it. And that's an absolute true story. You were like, I'll just wing it on a marathon? Yeah. <laughs> I, that, that is, I swear to God, that's true. The longest oh I had goodness. ever run prior to that was somewhere in 1985 in college. I ran 13 miles for reasons wow. that I won't get into right now. But <laughs> it's embracing the suck, if, if I can use yeah. that term. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So embracing the suck in training for something, but embracing the suck in the inevitable market upturns and downturns and sort of the sine curve of life that is being a professional trader or working on Mm -hmm. a trading desk because people that are non-equipped or haven't gone through it, they're not going to last. They might last a couple of weeks, a couple of months, but you know, if you're not positioned or equipped to handle the downturns or the suck, you're just not going to survive. You are very active on a personal philanthropic level, you talked about your involvement with the Leukemia Society. Can you speak a little bit about the role of personal service and philanthropy and and how important that is, especially when you're on the street? So, you know, I'm Roman Catholic, half Italian, half Sicilian, so I'm not one to quote from the Talmud, but I will for this podcast, you know, to save one life, it's as if you've saved the entire world. And that's true in philanthropy. Like if you can make an impact on one person's life, I mean, if you think about it, you've changed their world. So you have made a huge difference. And whether we acknowledge it or not, and I think a lot of people have difficulties coming to this realization because they think somehow it takes away from what they think they've earned on their own. But we've all been really given a lot. I know personally speaking, I've been given a lot in life without question. A lot of stuff that maybe I've earned, but a lot of stuff that I clearly have not earned. But in understanding that, I think there's a responsibility to try to give back and help people where you can around the edges. And, you know, I found that in Leukemia Society, a couple other boards that I'm a part of, and Big Brothers and Big Sisters. I was on the national board there. And, you know, I think it's really important. And the platform that CNBC's allowed me to be on for the last 17 or so years, people, for better or for worse, you know, they've come to know who I am. And if I can use that, whatever word it is, to try to help these different organizations, I'm absolutely going to do it. I love, love that. that. And I think that that's something that a lot of young people lose sight of. They're just trying to keep their head above water as much as they can and not realizing that being really active in that service on a personal level in a meaningful way from very early on in your life and your career comes back to you in spades. I've gotten more out of it than I've given without question. And I think more people should listen. I understand how busy people are. I totally get it, but you know, everyone thinks they're so busy. Yeah. Nobody's that busy. a shitload of time. Nobody's that (laughs) effing busy. Nobody's that busy. (laughs) I see you all on Instagram. I know nobody's that busy. (laughs) Not you guys, but the rest of you, everybody else, everybody else. And speaking of young people, You've got a lot of young people watching your show, looking up to you, saying, oh, my God, how, how do I get to his level? Like, how can I be able to talk about the Aim markets higher, about these is products? what I tell them. <laughs> Aim a lot higher. No, but what advice would you give to young people wanting to break into the industry in this day and age? What, what If you had to give them any guidance, what, what would you share? What- well, 
the networking is extraordinarily important. So I'm out of school. Mm -hmm. I graduated in 1986. So you can do the math, right? It's mm -hmm. coming up on 40 years. And what you learn is, and both you ladies, you, you've embraced it and, and come to understand it yourselves. And the people you went to school with and the network that's created around those classmates and friends grows almost exponentially over a period of time. So yeah. mm -hmm. use that to your advantage. You know, Don't isolate yourself. Reach out to people and take chances. What I tell college students is try to do something different every day, whether that's eat lunch with somebody different or join a different group, get yourself out of that bullshit comfort zone that we all find ourselves in and get out of that homogenous friend group yep. where you find safety, but you know, there's no growth in safety. Push yourself a little bit, try to sort of stand out and figure out a way to get on people's radar screen without being a complete pain in the ass. I mean, there's that fine line between yeah. persistence and being a complete pain in the ass, but you got to try to navigate that. And yeah. what I'll tell you is I think if you are young and listening to this, I think you'll be surprised by how receptive people will be to help you. The problem, of course, is, is nobody's going to know you need help unless you reach out to those people because they're busy doing their own individual things right now. If you're shy, you got to push through that. If you think it's bullshit, you got to push through that. You know, you have to reach out and you have to be an advocate for yourself because if you don't believe in yourself, I'm here to tell you nobody else is going to. Mm -hmm. I love that. Cool. This has been absolutely amazing. Thank you so much for contributing all of this knowledge for our listeners. Mm -hmm. I got so much out of it. I've learned so much. I, I Jen, think they all like, will as well. Yeah, again, as Jen said, she's always so excited on like anyone who can talk markets. Because it's like it brings me it's so her, much joy. It's her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Instead, but especially instead of, someone who I like mm -hmm. see on TV talking markets every day. I mean, like that's beyond cool. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. I enjoyed it. Continued success, ladies. Thanks for having me. It was an honor.